Good I love hearing all this chatter before church on Sunday mornings. Just makes my heart happy. Um, but if you would stand with us, if you're able, we're going to bless the name of the Lord this morning um, in song. <laughs> collective favorites it just is it talks about there is provision from God Amen. at every turn for us even if we have to look in a rock for it it's there Amen. we have provision in all things not just in the good things not just in the bad things not just in church but at work and at home and everywhere that we are we have provision because God is God all the time. Amen. Amen. Sunny in the rock, water in the snow, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. 
Deliver 
him this morning. You may be seated. I'd like to just take a few moments in prayer and ask that you join me. And I know that uh, all of you in this room, I believe that you would say this, we all believe in the power of prayer, right? And we believe that there's power when we come together to pray. So what I'd like to do, and we've done this in the past, but I'm gonna give you a chance to pray silently. Um, and I'm gonna, it's gonna be a guided time where we pray for people that we know. In fact, the, the first thing I'm gonna ask is all to pray in our own space would be, do we know anyone who needs prayer because they're discouraged? Anyone that we know that, that we know is discouraged and what they need is hope right now. So let's let's pray for anyone the Lord brings to mind right now. you to pray for someone that you know in your life who's facing a very critical decision and they need clarity. They need direction. you to pray for someone that you know who's grieving and they need comfort. And lastly, I invite you to pray for someone who's lost spiritually and what they need is Jesus. Father, hear our prayer. We know that you, Lord, inhabit the praises and the prayers of your people. And we lift all of these people, all these needs, before you and we trust Lord that you will answer in your time in your way and in your will and Lord what a blessing it is to know that we have you as our answer to prayer and so we seek you and we thank you Lord for the opportunity to come together to pray in your name and I pray all this in the name of Jesus amen I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward so that we might continue in our worship by presenting his tithes and offerings to him. Father, again, another aspect of our worship is to give. And Lord, we pray this every week and we pray, Lord, for the same things and it doesn't change. We pray, Lord, for the expectation of what we're, we give makes a difference in the kingdom of God. It's not just giving money, it's, it's going for a purpose. And not only that, we pray, Lord, that the people who give, that they give with a cheerful heart, as the scripture talks about. Lord, I pray that for the gift and the giver today. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Before we uh, look into the scriptures and also before uh, I preach the message God's given me today, I wanna just make some announcements. First of all, we're really uh, excited to have a few people with us today. Uh, first of all, Joe Dorman slipped in, and we're so thankful to have Joe with us today. Um, we've been praying for Joe and uh, going through her chemotherapy and all, and this is the first time she's really come back in a crowd. So, we're, Joe, we're so thrilled that you're here. And we're also so thrilled, you don't see him here, but I can promise you that he's here, it is Nathan Horn, Liz and Josh's baby, made his first trip to church today. Yeah, so. He's in the nursery, and I know he's doing well. He's being well taken care of. We, we trust that. Also, uh, I just want to announce Harvest Day was yesterday um, at Camp Dixie, and we wanted to give you the totals. We want to let you know, first of all, that the total 
giving was uh, $161,421. And uh, for, as far as GACC, our church, we contributed $9,974.99. Yay. Awesome. Fantastic. Also, uh, we do have a request for you, for the able-bodied people who can help us. As soon as the service is over, and I'll remind you at the very end as well, we need help putting up the table, not tables, but chairs, so that we can set up for the wedding shower for Michaela and Reed, who are here today. And uh, we're very excited for that. And, uh, and to finish our announcements, I'm going to have Ann Bailey, so she come up real quick. And she's going to make an announcement, a brief announcement about uh, something the Lord has put on her heart. And it's already happened, but how you can contribute as well. So, Ann, here you go. Good morning. Um, this is um, not only for how you can contribute or whatever, but I want to testify about how God has just blessed me um, and how he is blessing um, what took place out of a disaster in, as we know, in Western North Carolina with Hurricane Helene. There were two verses that really, um, that really spoke to me um, through this little thing that, that uh, actually Maura and I did. And I want to certainly thank her for her participation. But um, when we all saw what happened with Hurricane Helene, and, in, and as I saw some of the videos on um, YouTube or whatever about what happened in Western North Carolina, my heart just broke <laughs> to think of those people that have lost everything. And I'm sure that some of you, your hearts broke too, because you think of what we have and um, how God, you know, had blessed me and how he's been my provider and my healer. And I thought, what could I, I wanted to do something, um, but I'm not in a position to want to be able to go and help clean out the mud and that kind of thing. And, you know, what little bit could I do? And as I was thinking about that, God, um, I kind of had the thing of, um, well, there's things that I wanted to get rid of, kind of whether it was a yard sale or take them to a donation thing. But I thought, well, I'll do a donation yard sale. And the money that I collect will all go to Samaritan's Purse, who are doing such a wonderful job out there. So, um, and one of the verses that uh, God really showed me how much he blesses is the verse that's out of Luke that says, where Jesus said, Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. My heart is running over this morning in so many ways. Because one, God gave me an opportunity to bless somebody else, which made my heart feel so good. And um, in addition to just the financial and the realization of how much I have and um, how much those people are hurting without even having a home. Um, and the other thing, the other verse, is that all things work together for good to them that are, love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And there are so many things that the, the hurricane was disaster, and it was disaster for those people. But when you look, if you look at any of the YouTube things about what Samaritan's Purse has done, and of course they do this for hurricanes and situations all over the world, but what they have done from day one in going out there, you're seeing one, the neighbors got to see neighbors and, and communicate and be helping each other. And the help that's come out there has been from the churches, from the people in the community coming together and loving each other and helping each other even, even out of the little that they may have left, but they're all helping each other. So what we could do. And when God laid on my heart to do this, to have a yard sale and just take the donations and, and give them, not for my yard sale for ourselves, but to use that, um, I kind of thought at first, you know, like sometimes we do when God tells us something that we think, oh, I can't do that. or it won't make a, much of a difference. And as I was going through some things at my house, there was a box, and in that box there was a, a um, and it, this is a word that God gave me, 
And what, he, what it said was this little card that was in that box. It said, life is a risk. You can't steal second and keep your foot on first. Go for it. And that's when I said, okay, I'm gonna go for this and just do, I'll do what I can. And there's a verse at the bottom that says, do all you have, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. And that's from Isaiah 41, 10. And that's exactly what happened when Maura and I got together yesterday and did this little yard sale. Because like the people in the disaster, we got to meet, friend, we got to meet people, wonderful people who were generous and gave you know, from their hearts to help those two. And I know that there, we sent out, you know, I sent out the little thing to let you know what we were trying to do. And, um, and I know a lot of you couldn't be there or whatever. So the reason I'm saying this this morning is, first of all, I want to let you know that we raised approximately $350 to send to Samaritan's Purse to help with their efforts. And I just want to give you an opportunity to be a part of that blessing if you want to. Um, if you couldn't be there, you couldn't come by, whatever, and if you wanted to give a donation. Of course, you can do that yourselves, online, to Samaritan's Purse. Just Google it, they'll tell you how to do it. For human. But if you just wanted to give it as part of what we've tried to do, um, I will have a little donation thing at the back at the end of the service that you can put in whatever you can. And it all goes to help them. And I can tell you, my heart is just so blessed because of how many blessings God gave me. The opportunity to, to have a day to visit with Mora, the people that I got to meet, even neighbors, and, and as well as the opportunity to be able to help someone else in need and allow God to use that to his glory. So thank you. Thank you, Ann, for your obedience and acting on that, on your promptings from the Lord as well. Thank you very much. Our scripture text, if you have your Bibles, I do see some Bibles, actually paper Bibles, wow. And if you have your Bibles on your phone, uh, we're going to be looking at chapter, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 9, uh, starting with verse 17. Very short story here. Mark chapter 9, verse 17. Give me a moment to get there. Mark 9, you know, verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought to you my son who was possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashing, gnashing his teeth, and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? I, how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After that, Jesus had gone indoors. His disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. And God has blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You know, for a few moments, I'd like to ask you to do something that very few pastors would ever ask their listeners to do during a sermon. And what, here's what it is. I'm going to ask you to daydream. <laughs> We know that that happens as pastors, but we, we don't ask you to do it. But I'm giving you free reign to let your imagination run wild as you answer this one question I have for you. And here it is. What would you most like to hear 
said about you. If you could orally hear someone say something special about you, what would you want it to be? I mean, of all the wonderful possibilities, what would you want to most hear? I have just a few suggestions. Some of you might say, you want to hear, you are the sexiest man on the planet. <laughs> or you have the voice of an angel. Or you should be a model. Or you've been the best friend a person can possibly have. I know I don't say it enough, but you're the love of my life. You're my soulmate. Or when I grow up and have kids of my own, I want to be the kind of dad, the kind of mom that you've been to me. How about this one? I have to confess, you're right and I'm wrong, just like you always are. You're the smartest person I know. Or, if I was ever in a battle, you're the one person I'd want in the foxhole with me. Now, while we're daydreaming, I'd like to share what I'd most want to hear said about me. And if I could experience it, it would sound something like this. It would sound like this. Kenny, how long have we been friends? Long time, right? And in that time, you've never judged me. You've never judged me, even though your lifestyle was totally different than mine. Even though I didn't show any interest in Christianity. However, that hasn't kept me from watching you over these years. And the one thing I've really noticed about you is that your faith is evident in every aspect of your life. Your work, your marriage, your family, your decisions, your in crisis, good times and bad. Now, I'm not saying you're perfect, Kenny. You, I don't want you to get a swell head. But I've seen Jesus in you. And I've come to realize that I want what you have. I want Jesus in my life so that I can have the same peace, the same joy, the same purpose that you possess. Is there a Christ follower walking this earth who wouldn't want to hear something like that? Who wouldn't want to hear... I want Jesus in my life because I see Jesus in yours. Now, is it possible? Can our greatest witness be the evidence of the Jesus permeating every area of our lives? Is it possible? Sure, it's possible. And does it happen? Well, not as often as we'd like. Can we, we might all agree to that. And why is that? Well, I'm going to give you one long word. And that word is compartmentalization. Now, I know we've all heard that word. How many of us have learned to compartmentalize our lives? In other words, here's what I mean by that. We've become accustomed to neatly dividing our lives into neat, orderly sections, like putting Monopoly money back in the box when the game's over. You've got your, your work life, your, your marriage life, your family life, and then there's your, your finances and, and sex and leisure. Uh, we could keep going around the pie. And we've also been taught that it's important to keep our life sections in their proper places. Heaven forbid we mix them together and allow them to influence each other. Maybe you have a boss who, who's warned you at one point, uh, don't bring your family problems to work. Or maybe your spouse pleads, please leave your work at the office. Common wisdom declares, don't mix business with pleasure or religion with politics. And the message is this, that we hear so often, maintain the boundaries of your life. Paint inside the lines. Everything has its place. However, into our neat, orderly, compartmentalized lives comes the word of God. And I believe Kevin's got that verse for us, Colossians 3.17. And here's what the Lord says. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I'm going to ask you to repeat that with me. 
and we're going to start. I'm going to. I'm going to. When I put my hand up, we're going to stop because we're not going to read the whole thing. But let's read it together, if you can see it. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Stop. What is God saying to us through that verse? He's saying, look, there isn't a life section for Jesus because Jesus is our life. He crosses over all life's sections and influencing everything we do and say. And I know you agree with that, right? Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> and yet on the flip side, what happens when you and I relegate Jesus to one lone life section? and refuse to allow our relationship with him to influence the other facets of our lives. Well, I'll tell you what happens. When that happens, it's called living a double life. A double life. You say, what do you mean by a double life? Well, there's your spiritual life that you morph into when you're at church or maybe when you're having your quiet time with the Lord or you're saying grace at meals. And then there's your, your secular life that you morph into when you drive in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic with all the morons who've got their license at Dollar General. Or when you're arguing with your pig-headed spouse. Or when you're immersed in a group gripe session at work. Two lives, double life. I hate to admit it, but this is what happened with my dad. When, my, when I was growing up, uh, we started teasing my dad, I, probably when I got a little older, not when I was younger. That might have been a problem. But we'd say to my father, hey, dad, what you just said, is that the home version or the church version? The home version or the church version? Now, if you and I were to analyze our day-to-day -day lives, how much is Jesus immersed into all the areas of our lives? I think back to my old Bible college days when we used to play this strange little game during uh, dining hall when we'd eat together. We'd get our food and we'd, we'd sit down and it, we'd gather to get the food. As I said, we'd come to the table and uh, we'd all put our thumb, once we sat down, we'd all put our thumbs up and whoever was the last one to raise his thumb had to pray the blessing over the food. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Here we were, young men and women, pursuing life's ministry calls for our lives, and we're sticking up our thumbs to avoid being the one stuck praying. And then we'd bow our heads, and the loser would pray something like, Dear God, thanks for the food, we love you. Now was God somehow absent during the thumb game? Or did he not pay attention until we bowed our heads and prayed? Okay, they're being spiritual now. I'd better listen up. Now, it would be a lot funnier if it wasn't so in indicative of our double lives we can lead. Because oftentimes, this is exactly what the culture observes in many Christ followers today. Can we agree with that? They, they, look, at, they look at Christians and they say, we see you living two lives. We see you living one with Jesus, and we see you one that seems to be absent with Jesus, so we're not sure which one to believe. And then we sometimes wonder why people aren't remotely interested in the diluted, watered-down version of compartmentalized Christianity they see. So the critical question is, how do we live undiluted, godly lives where Jesus is fully integrated into our lives? So let's look at Jesus' life for the answer. In Mark chapter 9, the scripture I read earlier, Jesus performs a healing that stumps his disciples. And in verse 17, it starts like this. Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. It's like, Jesus, I brought him to your interns, but this seems to be a bigger problem than anything they can handle. So Jesus says, well, bring the boy to me. 
And so the father brings his son to Jesus, and on cue, the boy reacts exactly as the father described, which prompts dad to plead, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus is like, if you can? Everything is possible for him who believes. And then the dad utters what personally is my, might be my favorite line in all the scripture. It's certainly the most honest confession of the entire Bible. And what is it? I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And then Jesus turns to the boy, commands the spirit to leave. And just like that, he's healed. And yet the story isn't quite finished. In verse 28, we read, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? It's like, where was this on the discipleship test? Verse 29, Jesus replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Now, what's intriguing about Jesus' diagnosis is that Jesus didn't stop and pray himself, did he? He spoke directly to the demon and it came out. So what does that suggest about Jesus in prayer and how he did life? It says to me that Jesus lived continually in the presence of God. He did everything with God in mind. His words, his deeds, his interactions, his entire life was a prayer to God. His entire life screamed God. So the secret to Jesus' God-saturated life and witness was the fact that he consciously and continually lived in God's presence. And thus, this shaped and influenced every facet of his life. Now, what does this mean for you and me? Can we all just perform an internal spiritual audit right now without fear of incurring the wrath of God? This is just between you and God. I have a few questions for you. Do you ever lay in bed at night and think to yourself, you know, honestly, I never really thought much about God today. I didn't really pray today. I certainly wasn't at God's word today. You ever face an unexpected problem or crisis, and when it was over, you realize, you know, I really never asked God for his input. God wasn't on the radar. Do you ever read about Jesus spending a night in prayer, an entire night in prayer, mind you, to choose his disciples? And you think, I've never spent more than 10 minutes in prayer in choosing my house or my spouse. And lastly, how often do you typically, during your typical 24 hour day, do you ask yourself, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in this work situation that I find myself right now? What would Jesus do with this relationship that appears to be going south? Now, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anyone, including myself, but I just want us to honestly assess how conscious we are of living out the words of Psalm 16:8, which is this, I have set the Lord always before me. Psalm 16:8. let me say it again. I have set the Lord always before me. So how are you doing living consciously and continually in the presence of God? And how is your witness to an unbelieving world because of that? And you might answer this way, and I would totally understand if you said, you know, I'm not sure if it's possible unless you're Jesus. I just don't know if it is. And I want to challenge that. I want to challenge that with a personal connection from my life. And I want to share with you, I think about falling in love with a co-ed I met on my college campus. 
Do you know what it was like to fall in love with Kim? Well, of course you don't. You, you weren't me. But. <laughs> but here's how it worked. I fit her neatly into my life. I gave her her own neat little organized section. It was, it was the Kim section. And she had no other bearing on the other aspects of my life. Now, you don't believe that for a moment, do you? Especially if you've been in love. Do you know what it was like for me to fall in love with Kim? She permeated my life. I was consciously, continually aware of Kim. Now, I'm going to be totally honest with this, some of these confessions, and it's true. And I, want to, I just want to prove this to you. I remember being in class and studying and preparing for my career vocation, and on the back of my notebook, I'm writing in fancy calligraphy, Mrs. Kim Lattimore. I would listen to music, and no matter what the song was, I'd say, that reminds me of Kim. <laughs> dun, 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 another one bites the dust. I think that's Kim. It, it, it's, it's, it's Kim. This must be from God, you know? I drove 200 miles round trip every summer weekend to see her. And you know what? As a result, I spent most if not all of my money to see her. In fact, do you know how many times I ended up rummaging under my car seat or between the seats to find change just to pay a toll? I'm gonna to confess to you right now, I once put 17 cents of gas in my car to make it home on fumes. You know what else I did? I wrote her, and I've talked about this before, but I wrote her three to five page handwritten letters every week, single space. What did I ever say to do that every week? I remember eating at, a, at the family dinner table. My mind would be 100 miles away, and my dad would say two guesses as to what you're thinking about. So in short, let me just sum it up. I lived a Kim-saturated life which impacted my work life, family life, social life, finances, relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And what fueled this Kim-saturated life? Very simple, it was love. So yes, here's what I believe. It's entirely possible to live a Jesus-saturated life if you're fueled by a love relationship with Jesus himself. In John 14, 23, Jesus extends an incredible promise to his disciples of yesteryear and certainly today. And here's what he says. I think we have it. There it is. Yes. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now, I'm not sure if we all really understand the magnitude of what Jesus is promising here. He's not talking about becoming your house guest, where you give your, up your bedroom for a few nights and you sleep on the hideaway with a lumpy mattress and the iron bar that hits you square in the back no matter where you lay. He's not talking about that. Jesus says, we're making our home in your heart. Now, back in the 1950s, Robert Munger, if you've ever heard that name, he wrote a book called My Heart, Christ's Home. How many have ever heard of that? There's a few, Jenny and, and Kim. And since then, he wrote, as I said, he wrote it in the 50s. Since then, it's, it's been read by at least 10 million different people, uh, 10 million people, 10 million readers, and they've been challenged by it. And I just want to share some highlights. He writes, one evening I invited Jesus into my heart. What an entrance he made. It was not a spectacular emotional thing, but very real. Something happened at the very center of my life. He came into the darkness of my heart and turned on the light. He filled the emptiness with his own loving, wonderful fellowship. In the joy of this new relationship, I said to Jesus, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want to have you settle down here and be perfectly at home. Everything I have is yours, let me show you around. So in his, in his writing, he, 
he takes Jesus through every room of his heart one by one. The study, the dining room, the family room, the rec room, and even the hall closet. And each room represents a different compartment of the author's life. His relationships, his finances, his work, all the sections that, that comprise our lives. But as Munger ushers Jesus into every room of his heart, every facet of his life, he, he undergoes a challenge. He realizes that if Jesus is going to take up residence in his heart, if he's to fully integrate Jesus into his life, he must allow Jesus to transform each room one by one. Which proves to be a very a painful process, especially when he must deal with all the baggage in his hall's closet. And so the story, My Heart, My Home, Christ's Home, ends this way, and here's what he writes. I said to Jesus, would you take responsibility to keep my life what it ought to be? His face lit up as he replied, I'd love to, but I'm just a guest. I have no authority to proceed since the property isn't mine. Dropping to my knees, I said, Lord, you've been a guest and I've been the host, but from now on, I'm going to be the servant and you're gonna be the owner and the master. Then I took out the title deed to my heart and I eagerly signed my heart over to him for eternity. Things are a lot different since Jesus Christ has settled down and made his home in my heart. In closing, I think of the elderly man who answered a knock on his door, and when he answered the door, he was met by an enthusiastic door-to-door -door evangelist who blurted out, have you committed your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior? And the man responded, well, why are you asking me? I can tell you anything. Ask my wife and kids. Ask my neighbors. Let me give you the names and numbers of my banker, my mechanic, and all my bowling teammates. If you want to know if I'm saved, ask the people who I do life with to see if there's Jesus is really in me, immersed in my life. Do people see Jesus in you? Because every aspect of your life reflects around Jesus. So I want to leave us with this scripture. In fact, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to read that. Kevin, you got Colossians 3.17. He's right on it, man. That guy's right on it. Good job, Kevin. <coughs> and I'm going to ask that we read this together. And after we read it, I want you, if you would, let's all of us just pray that personal prayer to the Lord. Let's pray what we have just, the scripture we're about to read. Let's just pray this to the Lord in, in our own words. Our prayer to the Lord. So let's read it again. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's stop and pray that back to the Lord. Father God, hear our prayer. Lord, I think I speak for all of us when I say that, Lord, we do not want to be people who live a double life. Lord, we're asking through this scripture, whatever we do, word, deed, action, may we reflect Jesus. All that we do, all that we say, May people be able to, to look at our lives in totality and say, I see Jesus. I see Jesus in how you parent. 
I see Jesus and what you and how you handle your finances. I see Jesus and how you relate to your family. I see Jesus and how you are able to admit when you're wrong. I see Jesus and how you're able to say you're sorry. Lord, may people be able to see our life in totality again and say, I see Jesus in you. And Lord, this is our greatest witness. And I pray that for all of us, Lord, because the challenge is not to live the double life. Lord, we don't want to be people that have a home version and a church version. And I pray that for all of us, Lord, because we are all in this journey together. And Lord, we want to be a church, not only people, individual, but we want to be a church that exhibits this as well. And I pray that for GACC. And Lord, we lift all of these prayers to you in your name and to your glory and honor. Amen. I'm going to ask you to all stand as our worship leaders come and lead us in the closing song. I want to remind you, for any able-bodied people, can help us uh, put up some 
put up some chairs and uh, set up for the shower. Uh, if you would do that right after the service. And let me close with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.